Hi guys and welcome to this week's episode of The Deep Dive. Um, today I am extremely excited, extremely happy. I've got someone joining me today that I have been a big fan of for more years than I care to remember. Um, the gentleman that's joining us today is not only one of the world's best performers in my opinion one of the best all-round magicians but as far as a creator is concerned he is very prolific and created magic for all different magic genres he he, he is a legend a living legend ladies and gentlemen my guest for today mr dan harlan Oh my goodness, it's it's me. All those nice things you were saying, I was expecting somebody better. <laughs> oh, Dan, <laughs> honestly, you you are, I, I was into magic when I was really young, then I gave up, and when I started again, I was around about 20, I think, and you were huge on the scene back then, <laughs> and... I mean, you're huge on the scene now, but when when I joined, it magic was a different thing back then. There there, there yeah. was a, a you know a few magicians that you heard names of. There was yourself, Daryl, Amar, and you know you you were and are one of the big guys. And I learned so much from you and your videos, like VHSs back then. They, yeah, and, and and you know, and back then, uh, magic was more of a rare commodity than it than yes. it is uh, nowadays. I mean, there you know, there's uh, certainly a saturation uh, now that there wasn't in the past, and it was more it was a bit more exciting because you could only uh, see magicians if they appeared live. You know, yeah. Uh, so I uh, so I don't I don't know if uh, if you were back into magic when I did my first um, convention over there uh, i think it was uh like uh, ron mcmillan's uh, day or something i also did a black bull convention early on uh, back when it was a single day so yeah could have could have been yeah. during that time yeah it was i used to go to ron's um blackpool i i think my first blackpool was like 25 years ago or um sorry but i i don't remember seeing you at ron so i must have missed you there i I honestly don't, I've met you live, I've met you at Blackpool, you won't remember, but I've never seen <laughs> you lecture live, um, which I need to do, because your magic, everything you create is baffling, workable, and usually pretty obtainable for any skill level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Not yeah. Say... I, have, I have a very strict, uh, I have very strict criteria for uh, my own material. So the first thing is, you know, I don't market or teach anything that I uh, don't personally perform uh, or wouldn't use in some way. And and most of the things that I market are stuff that that I've done in my shows and I've just moved on, or I couldn't even currently be doing it. But but the criteria that I use for myself are pretty much what you said. I mean. Uh, it, it has to be it has to at least fool your your typical spectator and and have an interesting method that, that isn't easily obtainable. And especially nowadays, since most methods are easily uh, obtainable. Um, yeah. And then yeah. it has to be within a skill level that I can do. And I mean, I can do a lot of stuff. But what I what I mean by that I can do is that I can do it reliably in front of an audience even if I'm not really feeling up to a performance, you know, maybe I have to work, a, a, you know, a run like the castle run where you're doing three shows a night and you're doing it seven nights a week and you get a little tired, uh, you know, by the, by the last show. So yeah. you still have to be yeah. able to give your best and it's better not to have to pay too much attention to trying to pull off the slight in the moment, unless you absolutely need that slight. So I, so those are the two like behind the scenes criteria, but the third is the most important for me, and that is that it has to be entertaining. It's got to have a really interesting premise that engages yeah. people right yeah. from the beginning. So that yeah. that's the way I, yeah. you know, that's the way I design everything. It and it, it's, I mean, it really shows. Even if we look at the stuff you've had out the last few years, like the Awakening. I mean, even when I found out the method to that, I still had no idea how that was helping you. It, it, it <laughs> yeah, made right. no sense. I'm watching that video going, it still makes no sense. I can't see it. It's so clever. Yeah, because the method, I mean, the method is really more than just a gimmick. 
There's a yeah. there's a tiny little gimmick in the awakening, but you can't think about how that affects the method because the method is actually a bit more psychological and a bit more geometrical as a puzzle yeah. than yeah, yeah. than just that little gimmick. That little gimmick is there for the same reason that we've just mentioned. It just makes it easier for the performer to do what's necessary to be done. Yeah. So if I was to ask you this, and I don't know if you can answer it, with regards to your creations, which mm -hmm. are your favorite three? Oh, oh, favorite three. Oh, well, my my number one favorite uh, is and always has been uh, Starkle, which is the impromptu napkin yeah. tear, you know, where you tear out a circle and the piece changes to a star. And, uh, you know, that that served me so well over the years. And I, I came up with that when I was 14 years old. So I've been doing that for at least uh, five years now. And uh, and then <laughs> that's, you know. Uh, and then uh, the other one uh, is The Awakening. So uh, The Awakening, I, I absolutely love. And again, that is it's sort of based on geometry. Both of those are. Um, and I would say that number three currently is uh, The Mystery of the Missing Sock, which is actually pretty new. Uh, it's something that I came up with during the uh, Tarbell series when I was doing all of the magic from Tarbell. And it's the one trick that I came up with that went immediately into my shows and is still in my shows. It is available for anybody that wants to purchase it or take a look at it uh, on my new website, which is themystictower.com. So themystictower.com, you look for the mystery of the missing sock. And kind of a spoiler, I'll tell you that it is 20th century silk, but it's done with dress socks. And the premise, of course, is that every time you do laundry, a sock goes missing. So it's an audience favorite, favorite of mine, uh, and it, it it ticks all the boxes that we've talked about. Yeah, brilliant. I, I haven't seen that. I'm going to check that out. Um, there was a couple of, there's a couple of other things I want to speak to you about as well with regards to your website. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I just wanted to mention as well, because in recent years, the last two or three years, there's been... Um, a lot of routines coming out with sock matching. Now, yeah. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, I first saw that on your pack small plays big. I think. Did you uh, have? Well, a... no. I didn't have. I had a. I had a trick with gloves, so it's easy to kind of probably it confuse could have been the gloves. idea. It was. Yeah, it was a long yeah, time. Yeah, I did. I did ago. a. I I did a domino trick written large by using uh, gloves and, and people would join their hands and it was based on a, a domino principle. Uh, I didn't, I don't believe I did a sock trick uh, on there. Uh, there were other clothing tricks, t-shirts and some other things like that. Um, but, but really, you know, they, like the, the sock tricks that have come out as far as my memory serves me, uh, they came out after I had done the one for Tarbell, not that I inspired them, <laughs> but but I, I you know I think that that I might have been uh, you know on the cutting edge of sock yeah. magic. Yeah, yeah. You had so much great stuff out. I mean, a, a lot of people, especially younger people that um, are getting into magic or maybe been in magic, you know, for the last five, ten, fifteen years, may may not know. But you were one of the trailblazers with rubber band magic back in the day. Yep. Um, with band shark and e did you have easy to master band miracles as well that was you it was um uh, the it was magic with rubber bands it was right. was the the kind of generic title of a three volume series that i did that yeah. was very similar to the easy Ma easy to master series but we didn't we didn't use the easy to master title because uh, that was uh, that was something that um uh, that michael lamar had come up with and he oh, was using God, that God. for his series of things so we weren't we weren't going to use the same title uh for ours um but yeah there, i did i did band shark first and then i followed that up with a three volume series of magic with rubber bands so i am responsible you, you can you can blame me <laughs> <laughs> you you've just done so much and maybe the biggest project to date is um something i want to talk about with you because as soon as i saw you mention this I was one of the first people, unfortunately, 
not one of the very first people, but I was <laughs> one of the first people to sign up to this. And this yeah. is going to be huge. Tell us a bit about this new project that's going on. Yes. Uh, well, you're referring to the Masterworks. Uh, I yeah. couldn't really come up with a better title because I don't know specifically what the books will be titled. Uh, but I am going to be writing my life's work. So everything that I've ever come up with, uh, and it'll be three large volumes uh, that will be published over the next six years. So, uh, so it's the Masterworks Project, and it will contain, uh, each volume will contain 18 years of my career, which gives you a little bit of an idea how long I've been at this. Uh, so, um, so the first volume is, is going to cover my early years all the way up until the invention of cartoon. And then uh, it'll be cartoon through my uh, starting my work with Penguin will be the middle years and then Penguin and uh, and, you know, on currently it actually for the next four years that haven't even been released yet. Uh, so there'll be, like I said, three volumes. Each one of them will contain about 300 to 400 pages. Uh, I have a uh, I, I'm currently organizing the whole thing. So I have a wall in my uh, back studio space that is covered with post-it notes from top to bottom. And this is a this is a, a big wall. It's 12 feet tall through <laughs> post-it notes that are divided you know, <laughs> in those years and categorized. And honestly, there's so much uh, material there. So there's going to be tricks and routines. There'll be essays. There'll be stories. Uh, there'll be all kinds of uh, fun stuff uh, built right into it. I'm, I'm hoping, and most likely this will be true, that it will be interactive with augmented reality so that, you know, just by hovering your smartphone over something, you can automatically get videos. Those videos, even if they're not automatic, will be available, you know, uh, for anybody that purchases the series. Yeah. So, yeah, it's quite a project. The, the first volume will be due out uh, at the end of next year, and then every couple of years after that. Uh, if somebody's interested in it, you can go to themystictower.com and look up uh, Dan Harlan's Masterworks and uh, subscribe to it. And, and that's, that's the other thing that, I, that I'll mention is that I set up what I believe is a, an interesting model for purchasing in advance. So this is not, you know, a, it's not where somebody's going to buy the books uh, in advance and get nothing. What's going to happen is as I start to produce the work, if you subscribed in advance, you will get PDFs of pages uh, as I produce them. And that is going to start uh, very, very soon. Like I said, I'm in the organizing phase right now, and I will start to produce pages and send those out to subscribers. So it's a way of subscribers uh, keeping up with the progress of the book. Uh, those, those installments are not going to be you know, in the order of the complete book, you know, and, and it won't be everything that you'll get in the complete book, but it'll be yeah. more fun than having yeah. to wait for two years and get nothing. Yeah, I was really excited when I read the write up and I read that bit where it was, you know, you're going to get these little things. And for me, and I, I don't know if this was your fault, but it reminds me of the old days. In, in magic, <laughs> it reminds me, and I, I, say this a lot you know when, when we're talking about 25 30 years ago when those yeah. little catalogs used to come through the post four pages i used to i used to see it didn't want to read it it used to go in my bag and when i was on the train on the way to work or when i was having lunch i would bring it out they they meant so much having these yeah. little things that we could look through. I mean, magic was a different thing, as you said, and uh, you know, yes, having those PDFs yes. is exciting. And 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 I, you know, I I uh, I think all of the days of magic are are good days. Like right now, we are in a heyday of of magic communication around the world. You and I, right now, are having this chat, and we are, you know, at a great distance in different time zones. Uh, this is yeah. something that we couldn't have done in what people would call the good old days. Well, these right now are some good new days that will eventually be good old days. Uh, yeah. But I always, you know, I always love a little bit of nostalgia in uh, the magic that I do and, and in the way that I think about marketing things, uh, you know, so, so yes, I, when I, when I came up with the model of doing it as a subscription, it, it did remind me of 
when I did a magazine with Marv Leventhal, we did the Minotaur magazine, and it reminded me of, of like you said, you know, a, the, a time when we would get little installments or newsletters or catalogs, and, and they were very exciting just to get this tiny little piece of mat every once in a while. So I wanted to bring that back, that that sensation. Yeah, and and I think you've done it because I'm, you know, I'm really excited to get the first installment, um, and I would urge everyone to to subscribe and and pre-order these books because you know your creations they're they're just fantastic they're practical you you've come up with so much material over the years and i can't wait to sit there and start digesting it all again because yeah and pre-ordering does a couple of, of of great things obviously it will get anybody that subscribes to to this you know, those those little pieces so that they can follow along with the progress and there'll be a lot of interaction there as well you know if, if i'm if i'm writing something i may ask my subscribers you know what how much do you want to know about this do you have questions about this part and you know i can incorporate uh, suggestions feedback all of that uh, but it also helps me because i have to set aside so much time to write these uh, that you know, I, yeah. I need to have that that seed money in order that I don't have to devote my time to other things. Uh, so it, you know, it it helps both of us. Yeah, it does, and you know, it's a it's such a huge undertaking as well. But your past record, your past track record, shows that you don't shy away from these big projects. No, like the, I. The hard. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, the Tar Bell course was a huge undertaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have to. I, I, you know, I'm the kind of person that likes to likes to take on uh, what appear to be impossible challenges, uh, things that are that that nobody's thought of doing. So, so yes, I could just, you know, I could just write a book. You know, I could I could do the best of book, or or I could write a book about you know just my card magic or something like that. But no. That's not the way I think. I, you know, I, I think big picture. I think large projects. I, I think you know, uh, challenges that are that are interesting. That uh, that seem like they would be too difficult to accomplish. But really, that is part of the fun for me is to look at so much material and think about how can I organize it, and then how can I bring something new to to that concept. You know, how how can I how can I make this like the most interesting modern book that still feels like nostalgic yeah yeah I, I honestly i cannot wait so what what are your plans for the future with the mystic tower yeah so the mystic tower uh is a is a is a big project also that is starting out as a website uh and uh, we've also hosted um a uh, a magic convention here magicon uh that was uh in august we're going to do that again this year so we've got a website, we've got products, uh, we've got magic, we've got memory, we have the convention, but eventually uh, we're hoping that it will be a physical location and that that physical location will have um, a, you know, a museum, it will have uh, teaching spaces, uh, and you know, it possibly will have uh, you know, restaurant, dining, and you know, enter it certainly would have a theater. So okay. all of the, those kinds of interesting spaces that will be devoted not just to magic, but also to magic and memory and theater and some allied mystical arts and things like that. It should be a real fun project uh, that, you know, uh, we've only just begun thinking about it. And when I say we, I'm talking about myself uh, and my life accomplice, Sarah Elephant. She yeah. is a mnemonist. Yeah. Some of you are probably familiar with her work. And if you're not, check it out on the Mystic Hour. She's uh, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, really has the best memory work that I have ever seen in my life. And anybody that knows me knows that I would typically shy away from memory work. I, you know, I don't. I don't normally invest that much uh, of my time and mental energy into memorizing things. But she has made it absolutely practical, so easy to do, remarkable work. You should check it out. Yeah, yeah, she's incredible. Really is. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to talk about your latest release so this is a release that's come out with penguin um yep. it's one of my favorite effects and in fact i've got a question for you because over here do you recognize this box 
Yeah, I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is my first pack. This is one of my prized possessions, right? I <laughs> bought this at Davenport's. Got to be nearly 30 years ago, maybe. Was it? Uh, yeah, and I, I think uh, I think you would mention this to me uh, when when we were arranging this, uh, or you would mention it just in passing uh, in, in some way, uh, either on the, the cafe or, or on Facebook, uh, that that you were wondering if that is like an original, like the first printing of cartoon. So yeah. it's not. <laughs> so first of all, it's not a first printing. Well, let, let me take let me take a little look at the back design though. Right. Because if you hold up a back uh, there so that I can see it, uh, yeah. So that is a yeah. That's a rider back um, uh, bicycle. So that automatically makes it not a first printing. Uh, wow. So the first printings were done on Hoyle uh, back. So um, and the reason for that was when I came up with Cartoon, I you know I was pretty young. I didn't have a lot of money, and the uh, United States Playing Card Company was not doing custom printing for individuals they would do it for big companies uh and so they had a minimum run of twenty five thousand decks wow. so you yeah so you had to get twenty five thousand decks and their and their price per deck was around five dollars so a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars just to get into doing a custom print with bicycle so that that was a no-go so i had already done the artwork for cartoon, I'd already did a hand drawing. I already did. Um, uh, I was working as a graphic designer at the time, so I had plate ready film uh, made for uh, for any uh, you know printer, and I had done it with the bicycle layout, thinking that I would just take it to them and that they'd be able to do a short run for the thing. Just makes sense because it's just yeah. an overprint. Yeah. They can just overprint it on on an existing uh, deck, uh, but they still kept those minimums. They had twenty five thousand minimum at five dollars a deck. So I thought that cartoon was dead in the water. I thought there was no chance that I was ever going to get it printed by anybody. Because to me, that was the only good option was a bicycle uh, stock. But then I was on tour. I was lecturing. And uh, I was in, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I'm trying to remember where, uh, St. Paul. Yeah, St. Paul, Minnesota. And for some reason, it occurred to me, I remembered, that there's another major card printer in the United States. At least they were separate. They were independent at that time. And that was Hoyle. And Hoyle was there in Minnesota. So uh, I gave him a call. And I remember speaking to Gwen. Gwen was their uh, custom card division. And I said, here's what I want to do. I have the artwork ready. Here's what I'd like to make. Uh, what, what's your minimum? So she said their minimum was 1,000 decks. <laughs> And the cost was a dollar eighty nine each. Wow! So, so I mean, look at the difference, right? Yeah. And that's what I anticipated, yeah. it, because it's an easy job. Yeah. So I immediately yeah. placed the order with them and sent them the artwork, and then uh, I started uh, marketing the deck because back in those days, I was this was pre-internet, you know, uh, and stuff that we were talking about here. So I couldn't just go on the internet and get pre-orders from people or all that kind of stuff. So I went to the uh, the IBM convention in Salt Lake City uh, that year, and I took my sample deck around to each of the dealers, and I showed them that, and I took orders for dealer orders for the deck at, yeah. at that point. Yeah. And in just doing that, just walking the floor in one day, and actually one morning uh, at the convention, I already had orders for 5,000 decks. <laughs> <laughs> so it wow. was, I mean, it was an instant, it was an instant success before I ever sold a single one of them retail, before I ever made an advertisement before. And, you know, I laugh because there are no magic tricks that are like that. And and there nobody can do that the, the way that I did it anymore. But it gives you an idea of what we had to do. You know, I, I had to see if it was going to work. I had to put up some money to begin with. Uh, all kinds of things that have changed uh, in, in the modern marketing. Uh, yeah. So as soon as I was yeah. done with that convention, I went back, I called Gwen, and I raised the order to 10,000 uh, right away to, to 10,000 deck. Uh, and and once, the, once it hit the market, I sold a bunch of those. And I kept selling over and over and over again, kept placing, like every month I placed an order for 10,000. And actually it went 10,000, 10,000, 20,000, 20,000, 
50,000, 100,000. And in the first two years, I sold about 200,000 decks uh, total <laughs> through you know dealers and retail and, and public appearances and all of that. And again, there are no tricks that I know of that ever, ever do that. So if, if, if somebody out there has dollar signs in their eyes because they think they've got the best, next best great thing, you might have the next best great thing, but it's not going to sell that quick in those numbers. It just that just doesn't happen, uh, and uh, it's now a consistent seller. But I believe that that attention that that duck got uh, it it caused the uh, United States Playing Card Company to notice, you know, and and because they they didn't really take magic printing seriously. It was very challenging to get a uh, bicycle to print things for magicians specifically. Uh, and and I think that they noticed that there was this potential if they if they had the right trick and if they worked with magicians a little bit better, there was a potential to get some share of the market, a large share in, at this point that was going to their yeah. competitor. So that caused them to lower their minimum. They lowered their minimum to 5,000 decks and they brought those decks in under $4. So it was somewhat more reasonable. So what happened, and this brings me back to the deck of cards that you have, uh, I made a ton of money very quickly, and then the company that I was working with uh, most at that time was called Hampton Ridge Magic, and Hampton Ridge Magic uh, wanted to sell their company to Fun Incorporated, but they didn't have any flagship products in their line. Hampton Ridge didn't. And so uh, they bought the rights from me for Cartoon and Cartoon 2 uh, and a few of my other tricks, uh, early tricks there. And so they had a better valuation for their company that they could then sell that to Fun Incorporated. So Fun Incorporated bought Hampton Ridge Magic, which means that they bought the rights to Cartoon. Mm -hmm. And then they went, the Fun Incorporated went to Bicycle and printed those decks. Right. So those were so the first decks printed after the sale of the rights of Cartoon. Right, okay, because these are, obviously this is Cartoon 2, because that's the canon. And that's 2, um, yes, yes. And the other interesting thing is that mine, these are stripped. Yeah, and I believe that that was a mistake. I think that, right. it, just, that it just happened. And actually, those, since that's a Cartoon 2, that may have been printed by Hampton Ridge just before they sold their company. Somewhere in that that gray area of whether they had it or, or not, uh, because that was also part of the uh, the sale of Cartoon was they, they wanted Hampton Ridge wanted me to do a second version to increase the interest in the first version. And so uh, I came up with well, I didn't come up with that. Actually, uh, a friend of mine, Dan Fishman, came up with that artwork. Uh, Dan Fishman was a great magician from Detroit, currently lives down in Florida, still one of my best friends. It was his idea to, to do the uh, shooting out of the cannon. And so then I created that artwork and sent that off to be printed. Uh, yeah, but it was right at that that um, odd time. So that might yeah. be the first printing yeah. of Cartoon 2. Yeah, it's um, and it is one of those tricks that really has stood the test of time. I mean, there's mm -hmm. not many effects you could say that about, but... Um, a few years ago, we were doing sort of Christmas fairs. And obviously, I was doing the Svengali's, the mental photographies. The only other trick I took with me was Cartoon 2. And yeah. I could get a big crowd around me. This is my assistant. Everyone give us a drum roll on the table. He's going to get in. I could play it so big. And it... and. Honestly, people's jaws still drop the same way mine did when I first saw it at Davenport. Yeah, yeah. And, and it what I couldn't get my head around it, and it was my first experience actually, funnily enough, with bicycle cards. I remember ringing Davenport's when I got this home and saying, "What are these cards? Do you sell them?" And obviously, they were yeah. so hard to import in from America back then, and they were like, "Yeah, I don't know." 10 pound a deck or something ridiculous but i treated myself to one new deck every month that, that was it but this, i do yeah i remember those i remember those times too it was so uh it was so odd for me that that uh bicycle which is the largest card producer in the world at the time i believe uh was not readily available 
<laughs> everywhere, you know, and, and uh, so, it, but those, that was the way the world was. I mean, yeah. you know, now completely yeah. different. You can get, yeah, you yeah. can get just about everything. Yeah. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. But these are these are sort of a prize possession of mine. I've got yeah. a modern version, um, but this one I very rarely lose, uh, use. This is in my sort of on my shelf here, and I don't. Yeah, and I believe the uh, I believe the uh, the modern versions are probably all on the uh, Cartamundi uh, stock yeah. printed by Cartamundi, which is which is great. There is no complaints whatsoever. I, you know, I was never even aware of them as a card producer because, again, I, you know, back then I was stuck with having to deal with things that were that were in the United States. Um, but as the world opened up and uh, as magic uh, was being printed in different places, uh, they really are the best um, option for a, any kind of startup gimmick. Back was was part of yeah. Monday. Now and now somebody can just go online. They can go to customplayingcards.com or any site that's like that and print whatever they want to. Uh, so, man, if I had those options in the past, I, I probably would have gone with that because you can print a hundred decks. Yeah, if you want. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Well, I'm glad you persevered with it. And got yeah. it because the the magic world would be a sadder place without that little stick man. <laughs> yeah, well, I was gonna, you know, I was gonna do absolutely everything I could. I, fortunately, I I didn't have to do the next next step to have been uh, getting investors, trying to line up people who already had the capital, yeah, you know, to buy a huge order. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we it was great. We got it to work somehow. Well, now we're on to we're we're coming up to the end of this interview anyway. I know you've got things to do, but I, I'm just going to play yeah. the trailer because there is a new version which we've now got mm -hmm. in store at Alakazam, um, and it's cartoon remastered. So we'll take a look at the trailer, and then we'll come back and speak a little bit about it. Sounds good. I've actually taken the most charming trick ever and made it even more charming. This is Cartoon Remastered. That's right, this new artwork shows a complete story of the little stick figure magician reaching into the hat and actually pulling out a rabbit. For the first time ever, your audience gets to see the little bunny rabbit change into the card and every revelation is bigger easier for the audience to see and the method is more deceptive because the direction the cards swing let me introduce you to a friend of mine he lives over here in this card box his name is mr sticky and mr sticky is a magician and uh, you can see he's drawn on all of these cards but all of the pictures are a little bit different so that when you put them together he moves he uh, reaches up takes off his hat reaches inside. He's about to pull something out, but I don't want to show you what it is. Instead, I'm going to have somebody name a card. It could be any card, a high card, a low card, any suit. Uh, just shout one out. Uh, nine of spades. Okay, we'll use the nine of spades and uh, we'll place the nine of spades right over here where you can keep an eye on it. And now I'll show you what Mr. Sticky does. You see, he reaches up, takes off his hat and he pulls out a rabbit probably expected a rabbit, that makes sense, but of course uh, that's a magical rabbit. He's gonna shake the rabbit. Now, don't be too concerned, it's the rabbit's job. He shakes the rabbit and it turns into a card. And when he turns that card over, it is the nine of spades, the very same one. All of that takes nothing away from the original trick, which is still obviously my favorite trick that I've ever invented. And I'm sure you're going to love this brand new version of it. So please get Cartoon Remastered and see exactly the way that I've always wanted it to be seen. You're gonna love it. Is so good. I, honestly, Boy, it's... that looks that looks great. I want one of those. <laughs> it is. It's <laughs> it's such a brilliant trick. And in fact, I, yeah. I came up with um, a handling years ago, which we supply when they buy it from us, where you never remove the card from the deck. Neat. So that... Now, before before you before you, I don't know if you you probably don't want to show that here. 
No. Do you want to show oh, that here? No. That's fair enough. When we you stop can, recording, you can show it to me after we're yeah after after we're done with this. Uh, but I, I just want to mention that in that promo, you probably heard me say that it's that it's my favorite trick I've ever come up with. And then we started out this interview by you asking me my three favorite tricks, and I didn't even mention it. <laughs> <laughs> but. To be oh, fair, you did know okay. we're here to speak about cartoons. <laughs> to talk so. about cartoons, so I, so my mind immediately went to other three other things besides what yeah. we're here to talk about. Um, but it, but that is that's a challenge is to you know when when you when you only come up with things that you really love, which is what I do. How do you judge your favorites of the things that you really love? So uh, and cartoon was was pretty early on. Starkle was actually before Cartoon, and there were a few others before it. Um, so Cartoon is certainly my favorite marketed trick, the, the, you know, my favorite card yeah. trick, uh, lots of things about it uh, that, that are very, very close to, to my heart. And of course, the story that I told you about how to get it marketed. We didn't even talk about how it was invented. Uh, people have heard me talk about that before. You know, uh, all of this stuff is going to be in the book anyway. So you can wait, you can wait for the book and you can read the whole story as many times as you want. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, this new version, there, there's been a little discussion about whether it's better to see the rabbit, you know, or not, or whether, you know, whether it takes away from the trick or adds to the trick. So here's my thought on it. Uh, it definitely adds to the trick. And uh, the reason, the only reason somebody would think that the original is better, where you just see what appears to be ears popping out and then it becomes the card is because I came up with that as a justification for yeah. pulling the card out of the hat when I first drew the original one because I couldn't come up with a way of drawing the rabbit and doing all those other things. I only, I had a limited palette back then. Uh, I was working with a, a program called Freehand, which was a very difficult program to work with. Uh, nowadays with Photoshop and all of that kind of stuff, it was very easy, easy for me to do the, the, the original one, or the one that I just did now. So I've always intended it to actually be a rabbit coming out of the hat because that just makes sense. And because when you do that, audiences go, oh, you know, it's, it's charming. It's, you know, the idea of cartoon has always been to be as charming as possible with it, to really engage people with this flip book animation that, that has a nostalgic feel to it. And then this cute little bunny rabbit comes out, you know, and then a magical transformation happens. That's not magic because it's just animation, but it looks really cool, you know, the the bunny turns into a card and then people go, Oh, no way. Is it really going to be my card? And then you hit them with that revelation. Uh, and because, um, again, uh, I always wanted the card to turn sideways. It, it just, it makes that, that transition a little bit better. Yeah. If anybody knows the yeah. method behind it, that transition is very important it's because it has to disguise what's actually going on. So I always wanted that to happen. And in this new version, I made the cards a little bit bigger and a little bit more visible. Uh, I also added a, a little secret, if, uh, and I don't think I talked about this. Maybe I did in the instructions. But the, uh, the stage that's designed around the magician um, has some decorative elements to it that help to disguise what's actually going on with the cards. If you were to open the cards up a little bit too much, you would think that you were seeing the top of the stage when you're actually seeing something you shouldn't be seeing. As much as I'm going to say, if you yeah. think about it, yeah, that that little upside down other part will look more like the stage in the new one because it's something that it hadn't even considered in the, the first version. That thought never occurred to me. So in this version, I have fixed everything, even the tiniest little detail. Uh, that that yeah. you know, it, it only bothered me, <laughs> and it never caused anybody else any any problems and I never had a problem with it, but I thought, why not? Let's just go ahead. Yeah, it, it's great. It, it, to, to this day, it's still one of my favorite effects. I haven't played with the remastered, but straight away, adding the bunny there just gives you that moment to say, and guess what he's going to pull out the hat. And if they say rabbit, you say, yeah, but not any rabbit. This is a magic rabbit is going to change into a card. Yeah. And if they say card, you go, no, a rabbit. Oh, you, you've just got right. that, yeah. that lovely line, you know, that you can throw in there. But it, it's great. Dan, you, you are 100% a genius. It's been an absolute pleasure <laughs> interviewing you. 
Um, I'm sure everyone watching has um, taken something from this interview and learned a little bit more about you. Um, I certainly have, and I'm a big fan. I have been for, for many years. I just want to say thank you for taking the time to, to join us. Well, you're so welcome. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, and, and I do hope that uh, that people have, you know, taken something from this. Uh, and, you know, if, if nothing else, just think about those those requirements that I that I use to develop matrix and you'll come up with some really great ones on your own. Brilliant. So don't go away, Dan, because I'll be back in a moment and I'll, I'll show you this handling. But okay. once again, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Guys, so that was the incredible Dan Harlan. I really hope you enjoyed this week's uh, deep dive. Remember, if you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button and that notification bell, and you'll be notified every single time we go live right here on our YouTube channel. Also, remember, if you purchase Cartoon Remastered from us here at Alexam, you'll also get my uh, handling as a video where you never have to remove the card from the deck. Um, to me personally, even though I've come up with that handling, I still use Dan's original because it's, it, you know, to a lay person, it makes no difference. But if you want to add a little bit more of a magician fooler into it, someone that knows the effect, that handling will fry them. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week right here on The Deep Dive. Have yourself a great week.